Welcome across the cosmos to Richard and some guy present Deep Space and Dragons. I'm Richard. And I am some guy whose name you may or may not know if you've been tuning in in the past, you know, like two years. You know, I would love it if someone made it this far into our show and it was Richard and whoever the other guy was. That would just be great. Especially if, like, those two fans meet each other, the one with the full Carl tattoo and the one who has no idea who the other co-host is, and they just get in this huge fight. It'd, like, be making it to the end of Naruto and not remembering who Sasuke is. Peak. Peak entertainment value. <laughs> or, like, who's your favorite character in One Piece? Oh, I really like the Marines. <laughs> The Marines. Like, uh, I just hate how this one kid keeps taking up the screen time that's supposed to be going to Garp and Pals. Love the Garp show. All right, so. That would be pretty funny. What's new in the Some Guy verse? Well, okay, so. I got a little short and a, a true mini review. Um, Do I get a time you? No, no, I don't. I don't have a rating system, so it's, it's. I guess maybe it's not a true review, but uh, to be fair, Beetlejuice. Now I'm going to pause you on that one and completely distract your episode. As someone mm-hmm. who's taken many courses on writing reviews taught by like literal reviewists, scores mm-hmm. are the worst thing you can do when you're a reviewer. Actual critics and actual reviews don't give scores, but then like you'll put out your review for like Igan, and then they'll give it a score based on what you said. Scores aren't actually good reviewing. They're the, like, shallowest way to do it. It's like power levels in Seven Deadly Sins. <laughs> they mean okay. nothing. <laughs> Anyways, I went and saw Beetlejuice 2. Ha! <laughs> I almost got and, you. Uh, Can I make you restart one more time? No, maybe. You almost got it. What? That I went and saw Beetlejuice gotcha. 2? Gotcha! You said three! Ha ha ha! Trapped you! Ah! <laughs> oh, I see. I see what you did there. <laughs> Please continue now that you're going to die tonight. Beetlejuice doesn't just, like, kill people. Uh, who knows? Maybe he'd be attracted to me and want to get married to me. You know what? That tracks. Anyways, um, so uh, the original Beetlejuice uh, was quirky and, I mean, I'm gonna say old, my... and some of its concepts have been recycled, but it's still actually, I, I think it feels fresh. So I need to throw a new word. Macabity. Macabre and comedy, because mm. that's a genre mm. consisting of Beetlejuice and the Adams Family, and occasionally Ghostbusters. <laughs> Macabre, because like I'm sure they call it like a gothic comedy, like what we mm. do in the shadows. But I know those two words can combine. We got a C in there. But please continue while I try and solve this linguistics puzzle. Uh, but um, Beetlejuice Two is quirky still for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and the A plot has a lot of potential, uh, but the B plot was a complete waste of time. Uh, it, like it had no impact on the overall story. Um, and, uh, it's just, I think they really missed the mark there. Like I, th- I thought it, it, it had a lot of potential and then they just wasted so much time on, on the B plot. Uh, and overall, I, I, th- I think the first Beetlejuice was, was actually better than the second one. It's just, so you know what's amusing? is So you've been going through a lot of classic things. Like you're like, oh, I once saw this play. I watched this movie. And then me mm-hmm. out here with my like, I don't know, 40 plus lit classes. You know what I'm watching? Kengan Ashura. The single <laughs> dumbest thing. When they made their dramatic reveal last episode, that one was the Kengan and the other was the Ashura paired together. <laughs> That is a line. I am not paraphrasing. It turns out the old dude is the Kengen because of his bloodline, and he's paired with the Azura. So, of course, the legend of the Kengen Azura strikes new. I love when an anime yells out the title. And the dumber the title of the anime, the better that moment. <laughs> okay. Like, but, okay, but, please continue. Um, well, I mean, I, I, have, I don't want to give any spoilers. I don't want to go into too much detail. What I actually want to talk about, which uh, <laughs> is more of a... Uh, uh, public service announcement kind of nice thing. note the values Indeed. and views held by this show are richard and some guy and should not be taken seriously by anyone don't sue us well okay um in 2009 there's there's uh, was a story that was circulated about a bank teller uh that worked 
that, that uh, his window got was getting robbed, and uh, he like jumped over the counter and beat the guy up, and then the guy ran away and he tackled him and held him until the police got there. Right? Never um, do that. And then, after, and then afterwards, uh, he was fired because he didn't follow pro- protocol. Yeah, which would be to just give the guy the money. The money is federally insured, uh, and uh, like you, you don't want to escalate the situation. Not only that, but so as someone who's also been a manager of kitchens in my scandalous youth, Sparkle, mm. if you let one of your staff members start tackling people, and other people do it, people die. Right? Like this mm-hmm. is—you don't mess around. You do not, under any circumstances, want your staff members heroically dying over company profits. Like, no. But, so, uh, what's new with me, uh, you know, it was... Uh, As you was tackled slow... someone through a window? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a slow Saturday <laughs> af- evening, early evening. About, about like Twilight, o'clock, golden the hour. The, the sun was still up. It was all right. Uh, and uh, my boss... He was bored because it was slow, and he's kind of just pacing back and forth. Doing Has he considered reading wife, the Waltz of Blades? <laughs> doing things uh, to annoy his wife, who was making pizzas. Wow, you know, you're not even going to dignify that plug with a response, but fine, go on. That was such an <laughs> organic advertisement and everything. Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, he likes to do things like squeak his shoes, or like, you know, scrape them on the floor to annoy his wife, or he'll like hang bills upside down, or... Or he'll make them print really, really long with long gaps. Anyways, he was bored. He was just messing about. Uh, the door beeps, and he sees customer come in. Uh, but this particular customer uh, was <laughs> wearing a, a purple sweat purple sweater wrapped around their head, with like the hood over their upper head, and then the rest of the sweater wrapped around their their like jaw. So I am like and... picturing the most generic Final Fantasy ninja enemy. Uh, he definitely he did kind of have a generic ninja look, uh, like not it, a it good ninja, good. like a bad like you got eight bits and you did what you could ninja. Yeah, I mean he didn't really didn't really do uh, the full outfit, the full ensemble. He's he was just wearing like black clothes otherwise. But um, as my boss rounds the corner, uh, the guy pulls a sawed off shotgun out of his out of his pants. You know this um, was going what. So the thing is, you tell me because you think like, oh, this should be said off stream because this is important. And the things you don't tell me, I've once said that Carl's special <laughs> power is he universally rates all things as equally interesting. Because then mm. I didn't get a heads up about this. No, please. Why would we have a backup topic for this episode? At work, someone pulled a saw a ni- badly dressed ninja pulled a sawn off shotgun on your boss in your actual <laughs> real life. In Canada. Okay, so I mean, firstly, uh, the front door. There's like the the long counter, and you have to come around the side, and then you have to go all the way around the counter to get into the kitchen because the door is on the opposite side of the opening on the counter. Okay. Uh, and uh, the guy didn't wait very long. He just, as soon as he saw someone coming to serve him, he just started like trying to pull it out of his pants. Um, what? And uh, so my boss immediately was just like, "Oh, everybody, run!" And he like kind of shuffles everybody, and we all we all kind of uh, go through go through the door and, and head outside, except for our, my poor coworker uh, James T. Kirk. Perfect, but also I, I don't really want to joke about this because someone might die in this story in the next ten seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I it, it is serious. Like I say, um, yes. Like I said earlier, the 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 guy uh, that worked for the bank got fired because it is unsafe to try and be a hero. Oh no! Uh, and it's just not worth it. Uh, and so, like poor poor James T. Kirk, uh, <laughs> he was uh, bent over picking something up off the ground right behind the, the line as as my boss shuffled us all away. And uh, by the time he stood up. Uh, he uh, he had the gun pointed in his face. What? Now, luckily, uh, James is a is a pro. Uh, apparently, he's been involved with uh, like six or seven armed robberies. Uh, so he just puts his hands up. By pro, do you and... mean cursed? <laughs> he might be cursed. <laughs> uh, but so he puts his hands up. Uh, and the robber uh, directs him to the till. He opens the till, puts the money on the counter. 
Uh, and then the robber like takes the money and out the front door. Um, <laughs> and so then uh, we see the robber leave out the front door. We kind of follow him a little bit to see where he's going, but then everyone kind of heads back inside. Uh, the police show up pretty much right away uh, because uh, especially gun incidents uh, are a high priority for the police. Like they, yes! they will respond very quickly if there's a if there's a gun involved. A little bit less quickly if it's like a knife or a baseball bat. Uh, and then if there's no weapon, then you, I mean you'll get a response eventually. What is this world you live in? <laughs> I mean, no, I'm just saying that, that logically speaking, there are severities, the degrees of severity of crime, uh, and it's like I think a domestic abuse case would probably be pretty pretty high up on the scale. But like gun violence is like their number one priority. They want to put a stop. Can to I that. give a weird mini rant? Hmm. I, I just have to give a weird mini rant. Stop trying to rob low-income poor people. So, the law office I'm at, a law office which deals with triple-digit, quadruple-digit, million-dollar cases, our door's wide open. A door stop plugged in it. There's cake at the desk. We offer you a coffee. There's a self-serve mini fridge. We have no, like, magical protections going on. But they choose the pizzeria. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, supper rush is a somewhat reasonable time. I mean, it was still light out, which is a little bit of like, okay. Now, you, and, you don't uh, understand. We, you know, Your pizzeria will never have as much money in it as a law firm. You're probably right. Ever uh, come I mean, close. We, we only had like a couple hundred dollars in the till at the time. So kind of my point. With that much. Um, but uh we got the footage, they radioed the description of the suspect, and the guy was caught within 10 minutes. Like, it's, Well, it's... yeah, he dressed as a purple ninja and pulled a shotgun on someone. This was not a perfect crime. <laughs> yeah, and like I say, middle of the day, he didn't even have time to take off his ninja headband. Well, uh, the thing is, like, say he actually, him. like, dressed as, like, Itachi and the Akatsuki, right? Mm -hmm. Then what you do is you, like, go to the bathroom, put on makeup remover, take off your outfit, and they'll never know who you were. <laughs> Because they'll right. be looking for the person with the red spiral eyes instead of regular eyes. <laughs> that is so crazy. Your life is insane. Um, but the 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 moral of the story is uh, that like uh, a lot of people, the story from two thousand nine about the bank teller that got fired. A lot of online responses were the outrage that this guy got fired for being a hero. Uh, but I mean it. In my personal experience... He could have got everyone killed. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, apparently uh, the weapon was not loaded and he didn't have any ammunition on him. But you don't want to find out. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to find out. Well, uh, like... And, and, like, property damage could have happened if, if uh, like... <laughs> like, if he had fired his shotgun at the oven uh, and hit, like, a gas line or something. Like, jeez. So, like... Once upon a time, when me and you were walking down the street with swords, we got pulled over by the police for walking down the street with swords, right? They were okay, props. Clear, uh, they, they, yeah, they, they were wooden swords. They were There's props. No real, no real swords oh, in the yeah. story. But they should have pulled us over because we were walking down the street with what looked like swords. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I'm a firm believer in sensible choices. If someone puts a gun to your face, do not think you're John Wick in that moment. Think you're John. <laughs> just a guy named John. <laughs> like John Arbuckle, default to John Arbuckle, not John Wick, is the takeaway here. Be like, I got a cat at home. No risks to be taken today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, that's what's that's what's new with me is that uh, the, the my work got uh, the shotgun story being like movie. the B plot and the A plot being Beetlejuice the musical is just wild. <laughs> like I don't even know how to process this information. Because we're comedy. I'm like, well, I'm glad no one got hurt. But no warning from my delightful co-host here. So he could have been like, so I'm in the hospital right now. My arm's gone. And I'd be like, yeah, you would do the podcast if your arm shot off. Why would you not? What else would you do? You're stuck in this bed armless. You might as well do a podcast. Might as well. Oh. Well, no, I, like I say, fortunately, uh, no, no one was hurt. And the... Uh, assailant was uh, apprehended very quickly. So, what's funny uh, is, so I live in Brampton. Spoilers. They mm -hmm. figured this out. I have mm -hmm. an author profile. My face is on the book. Anywho. 
Mm-hmm. And people in Brampton like to say Brampton's sketchy. Right. Because they've never lived in reality, right? So they'd be like, ooh, Brampton's sketchy. I'm like, oh no, someone got held up by knife point. And it's like, what? Saskatchewan wasn't that sketchy. I'm like, Purple Ninja pulled shotgun out of his pants. That is the thing I get to tell people happened. Unironically. It just happened. People just take picnic tables there. It's crazy lawless hellscape. <laughs> it is a lawless hellscape. Uh, but, oh, uh, that is just so I, wild. Now that I've made my public safety announcement that, you know, just like, like say, if you're ever being in, in a violent confrontation, uh, it's best not to resist. So here's the thing about my life over the last five years now. Since mm-hmm. returning to academia and working primarily academia-related jobs like law firm, editing, podcasting, school events, pathway fairs, it's funny because I have like such a state of zen because no one pulls shotguns on me. Because it's like <laughs> I'm in this law firm looking up some papers, doing my thing. And boss like, oh, you haven't taken a break today. I'm like, yeah, I have a chair. I have smooth jazz playing and I'm reading through a redacted about redacted. This is the least stressed I've ever. The fridge is stocked. You don't understand, sir. We work a job where I can get up, have a cupcake and drink this. And I don't have to tell anyone I'm doing this. I can just do this at my leisure. The book will wait for me when I get back. I can just go to the bathroom. I don't have to announce it. I don't have to check in with anyone. I can just go. Like our entry level jobs are so savage. Who decided that bank teller uh, that cashiers don't get chairs? Because I don't mm. know if there's a bad enough afterlife for that person. Like Soul Society <laughs> is too good for the person who decided that cashiers work slower if they have a chair. Ooh, I mean that does sound like it might be the Beetlejuice afterlife, but that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, or what was it? I think it, I don't remember the name of the movie. I think it was something like Risk Cutters, where when you die, you just go to a slightly worse version of reality if you kill yourself. Oh. As like punishment, it's just the same life, but blander. Like the colors are just washed out more and the food tastes more like redacted fast food replace. <laughs> because it's like this situation is just so crazy to me, because like I said, some of these places I worked have such higher stakes, but such lower intensity that it causes a weird dissonance. Mm. Like, for example, the registration office at Redacted School I go to was behind on everyone's registration paperwork. So everyone get, doesn't get their student loans for a couple of weeks longer. Mm-hmm. So if you think about that, if you assume that if you miss a payment, you have to take out a payday loan as 200 bucks. And every right. student's payday, uh, payment was late. That's like $200,000 lost over that bureaucracy. Mm. And no one cares. <laughs> Imagine if one of your coworkers cost your franchise $200,000. Because they didn't click send on a button. You think they'd care, right? But they don't. Because they have money. Why would they care? <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty crazy. So it's like wild to look at just some of these contexts. Like it'll be like we've started this new init- green trash can initiative, dropped ten million dollars on new trash cans, and I'm just like, the world is insane. <laughs> but uh, so I mean, that's that's enough about uh, the is wild it? wild west of Saskatchewan. Because uh, like you just had you there, Richard. Well, I kind of weaved a bit of news with me, kind of into it casually. So. For the summer, I've been volunteering at literary magazines, working at a law firm, living my best life. Tomorrow, I'm going to Mm. a magazine launch. No, Thursday, I'm going to a magazine launch. Good luck hunting me down. Then Sunday, Mm. I'm going to a book festival. Then I'm Mm. working on this big student initiative project that I can't really talk too much about. Mm -hmm. So I have like a bunch of like high-end projects going on, working on my next book. See, my little nerd brain is very happy. So Mm. my new project with the school means I have to, like, go in person three days a week. And I think that's really good for my mental health because I think I've spent too much time at home over the last couple months. And I'm starting Uh. to go mildly insane. It's like I need to leave the house and not be working on projects to get inspired for projects. Like, while reading through the Rental Properties Act, boom, entire psychic power system comes to my mind clear as day. 
Because <laughs> my brain is trying to escape reality. But since my life isn't sad and traumatic anymore, I need to force myself into escape of situations to trigger my imagination. <laughs> nah, but in all honesty, it's been like pretty escapism. <laughs> like not actually. Like it's been a very low key but good summer. Like people like to be like, oh, don't you want a guy who's adventurous, enjoys travel, wants to see the world? Like, no. Why would I want to be that guy? That sounds terrible. I like my comfort zone. It's so comfy. <laughs> It's like, I didn't yeah, spend five years legit. making a cozy life to then leave it to explore. Are you people mad? <laughs> I'm like, a new Baldur's Gate patch launched and they added in official mod support? Yeah, why would I leave? But now, nah, like, I'm going to some literary Ooh, events and a book launch support. this weekend, which is pretty cool. And other than playing some Gundam Breaker, Are and you? that's pretty much all I've been up to, really, is being chill because and turns out Studying for LSATs and being a lawyer is a time-consuming endeavor, even as a volunteer capacity. Are you allowed to uh, say what book launch you're going to? I am, actually. So, an acquaintance of mine, another Branton author, has written a new book called Countess. It's Susan Palumbo, and it is a sci-fi, anti-colonial, Count of Monte Cristo in space and yeah, a post-colonial space opera take on Dumas's novel moves at a whiplash-inducing pace. Spends a speculative reamps of classics will find plenty to enjoy. Quote publisher weekly. Huh. Okay. So you know the things I enjoy in book form. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So like, it's a good solid LGBT plus sci-fi retelling of things, which makes me happy. <laughs> and it's right in my genre so I'm like this is good stuff like plus I'm always happy to see an author like make it make it be like oh look at you with your English degree hitting it and getting the interviews going on the book tours and watching your career skyrocket that's inspiring to watch that happen to a human being that, that makes me mm. not regret my life choices at all <laughs> it shows possibility in the craft <laughs> but Nah, seriously, seeing an acquaintance of mine start winning awards for a piece of science fiction makes me happy. Understandably so. Because, like, it seems to be doing, like, mainstream good, not just sci-fi good. The press that does it, ECW Press, typically does more, like, non-fiction essays and, like, culture pieces. I believe, mm. oh, I'm trying to remember what the press was originally called, but, like, it was, like, entertainment, culture, and writing or something like that. Okay. So it's – they don't actually have a ton of science fiction in their catalog. Yeah, entertainment, culture, and writing. So they try and, like, build to the cultural capital of Canada through their things. So they're a Canadian publisher. So for a sci-fi piece to take it off, that means the core undertonings, the, like, actual messaging behind it has to be really strong. Right. So I'm excited to go. Plus, when they are doing their, like, book touring, they were, like – cosplaying the cape and like the aesthetic and I just respect the idea of showing up to a book signing in a cape <laughs> that's like I regret that for watching my first book I didn't like show up to plate mail for book signings like that is like clearly lesson learned why would I not do that it's an excuse to be awesome <laughs> well speaking of sci-fi um, I mean it's not exactly a perfect segue because uh, the the intended topic is noir fiction is that where we're going uh, with this? Because I thought, like, you're like, speaking of. <laughs> well, you see, um, I, I chose the topic of noir fiction for a couple of reasons. But the first one being, uh, as, as Richard knows, I, I have uh, written a, a sci-fi short story of my own. Yes. Which uh, I'm planning on submitting to a magazine, the FF Magazine. Yes. Which, Fusion Fragment Magazine. Um, They're excellent. They're open for submissions. Check out their latest issue. Support literary magazines. They're the stepping stone between new and established writers. Yeah, mm. that's my plug. They do not sponsor this show. <laughs> but so, uh, as Richard has said, off stream and maybe on stream too, but uh, there are a lot of literary magazines. And I was thinking, it's like, well, you know, even if I don't get uh, submitted, uh, even if I don't get published in the magazine that i'm going for uh there's other options but 
it would be better to write a different story. You're right. And well, you are to a certain extent. You're definitely like so. Literary magazines will often say if they accept simultaneous submissions or not. If they accept simultaneous submissions, usually aiming for like three or four in your genre is completely reasonable to do. Mm. So for your story, it's like not everyone will accept it. And sometimes people can get over fixated on a singular goal. So if I were mm. you, I'd probably send your story to – I have like a list of five science fiction ones. Okay. But you're right. You don't just wait on that one story and keep trying. Once that's out there, you continue writing because writing is how you write your craft. Mm. But I am deeply uh, curious where you're going with this. Well, okay. So I'm trying to think of, it, of another sci-fi concept. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came back on uh, a random question I have, which which actually, okay, I'll, I'll ask you uh, there, Richard. Uh, what? You're not going to bring went... a third person in the middle of our episode? <laughs> uh, say you, you meet someone on a on a dating app, right? And uh, you go what? on the date. That's so hard to believe. <laughs> you, you go on the date. It's fantastic. Uh, and then you wake up in their laboratory and they've turned you into a crime-fighting cyborg uh, because they think you're their soulmate. Uh, would you fight crime with them? So you've definitely asked me this question before somewhere. Probably. So it's, it's been in my mind for a long time. As much as I can't figure out the pipeline to how this ends up being about noir fiction, because like I'm super on board with random sci-fi short story pitches. That's my that's my vibe. Like mm-hmm. I will happily entertain sci-fi pitches. The wackier the better. But because of right. who I am, so in. The terrible Mega Man 90s cartoon. Mm. Back when, like, they just felt like it, Mega Man wasn't sexist enough. It's like, okay, we're going to give Roll a vacuum cleaner and have them be a house, robot housekeeper. Well, Mega Man goes and fights crime. I'm like, Mega Man's, like, supposed to be 12. Why are we playing into anywho? I would most definitely, when made a cyborg to fight crime, end up as a house husband. It might not be instant. <laughs> it might not be overnight. <laughs> but if my nature is a being... My upgrader would become clearly apparent that my fingers turning into knives is better suited for sashimi. Like, how much my culinary <laughs> abilities would improve if – first off, thank you for turning me into a robot. I'm giving partial consent to this if you know what you're doing because my body sucks. This is a well-established hmm. fact. Like, if I end up <laughs> right. a dysgraphic robot, I'm going to be very displeased. <laughs> It's so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, realistically, the robot upgrade, like, if I'm getting Dr. Giraud, it's probably helping me out. But, you know, I am mm. super big on consent. So, like, there's mm. couples counseling that needs to happen here for this to be an yeah, acceptable yeah, okay. choice. Unless it was some weird culture thing. So, hot take. There was an animated series about an old man where aliens accidentally kill him and they rebuild him as a super cyborg. Mm-hmm. The aliens didn't know better. Right. Right. So the person who makes me into a cyborg is literally an alien or a time traveler or from a very cyborg culture and simply has never been explained that you need consent to cyborg people. Mm. And then after we have this talk, they solemnly swear to never cyborg anyone else. They didn't understand. They thought they were helping. I'd give them a pass Mm. because I have issues and deep seated loneliness (laughs) problems. (laughs) <laughs> okay. okay, but so... Um, so the answer is yes, with several asterisks, because they really cannot be going around doing this to people. <laughs> okay. But so then, uh, I realized um, that's more of an event, and not really a story. So, it's interesting. So, when I was giving this... When my professor was giving this talk a few years back, weeks back, I think I mentioned in a previous episode... He was talking about the, what is the catalyst to start a story? Write your first 10 ideas down that you think would be a good start of a story. Now erase the first 10 because they've been done before. So like coming (laughs) up with an original start is tricky. And sometimes I'm always on the fence whether or not I really think originality is that important. Right. Because I'm a fan of refining the craft and I read a lot of derivative things. Most things are just based of John Carter on Mars after all that I enjoy. So whatever. But like... (laughs) As you said, it's a catalyst to start a story, but that's not actually what the story is about. Right. Um, Now, if the story was about uh, it, it would literally be they start dating this person and you would make that be like the climax of the story as they wake up in the basement as a robot. And it would become a really robot call. 
<laughs> Rombot.com? Rombot.com. <laughs> no, no. Um, so I, I start thinking of, of ways to actually make this into a story. And I, I settle on, um, instead of focusing on the um, kidnapper robot dynamic, and more so focusing on uh, it being a missing person's case uh, that's being investigated. I mean, you could go that way. Uh, and I'm like, you know, yeah, yeah. well, I mean, uh, the investigator uh, probably has a uh, cybernetic eye. I'm toying with the idea that it, it was like a AI that got implanted into them, and the AI is actually taking over their brain. But they're, they're still trying to fight crime. What, anyways? It's, I don't know. There's lots of ideas on the table, but the main thing is uh, that I was like, hmm, well, I mean, Richard mentioned a while back that he might want to write a, a noir story. My idea: no stealing, swiper, no swiping. <laughs> it seems like an interesting idea. Swiper, no swiping. <laughs> and then I realized. I don't know what noir is. So here's what's really interesting about noir, because this is a good pivot. Whenever I think noir, my brain goes to a weird episode of Samurai Jack. Okay. There's an episode of Samurai Jack about a robot, I think it was X-23 or something, who was sent okay. after to kill the samurai because his dog got taken. But they completely okay. frame it as a noir f- style, black and white dark eternal monologue to himself trying to track down this person to get a sweetheart puppy back and they use like as many noir film tropes as they could and then your protagonist has been following just gets unceremoniously ended by Jack Oh! and this episode is like 90% darker than the rest of the show and was like Samurai Jack was good for just doing weird experimental things with their episode of the week format right and I'm like yeah they're just like, let's just steep this in tropes, because you can absolutely have robotic noir. So hereby, because I was researching this myself recently, the definition for noir is a dark, gritty story about typically framed in a 1960s urban setting where a morally ambiguous character character narrates their actions, typically evolved around a bad-hearted dame or a good-hearted dame. And about the moral ambiguity of crime and effect, and typically is resolved as a as a, not a melodrama, a uh, bittersweet ending. So like Cowboy Bebop mm. was easily noir themed because you got Spike narrating it, being morally ambiguous as he argues like good and value of a human life, and then spoilers for Cowboy Bebop getting shot at the end has noir mm. film vibes because like noir right. films really like. Casablanca energy. And mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. it's one of those tropes where I've probably seen parody more than I've seen originals. Right. Because it's easy to do the hardball detective episode in black and white. Even Ruby, Ruby Chibi does it a couple times. Well, okay, so interestingly, uh, I I looked up a website and I was like, I was like, how to write noir. All and, right. Uh, I'd love to hear your definition. Like, well, no, I mean, my, my definition, the, the main difference between my definition and your definition uh, is that everything is done on the backdrop of systemic corruption. Oh, I missed that. that, that yeah. That, that's, that's really the only difference between what you described and what, and what I found as a definition. Uh, but um, I'm reading through this list of all the different uh, beats of, of noir and, and, and how you should design your character. Also, 90s and Batman. The, <laughs> Batman the anime yeah. series is one of the most noir things ever created. Also, blimps for some reason. <laughs> but like the, the website itself wasn't actually all that helpful. It was, it was like, oh, usually there's detectives, but not always. Usually they're a male protagonist, but not always. And I was like, hey, like, what? so I, I think. Like, hmm? So I think part of my yeah. explanation that might help your clarity is it's the gritty internal monologue. That's actually why it's usually detectives, but sometimes isn't. You need a character Mm. who's disillusioned, gets shown a silver lining, and then that silver lining gets taken away. So detectives Mm. are such a natural device for the, okay, I'm morally ambiguous in a morally ambiguous situation trying to find the truth. And then the truth can't be satisfying in noir. Mm. So like when you go to Sin City or... Even Batman, for example, Batman ended up as a detective, not because 
he'd beat anyone with prep come at me, bro. But that lets him mm-hmm. looks at, oh, the psychiatrist broke trying to save him, and there's no happy ending here. Mm. Or, oh, this former socialite has fallen down our times, and the girl I was seeing turns out to be a cat burglar. It lets you have that, like, dissonance of, like, trying to find silver linings where there aren't any. Right. So Detective naturally leads you to a character who monologues the because you need that internal monologue or external monologue as the framing device who does mm. case studies. And that's why noir is usually typically really, ep- really episodic. Did that help at all? I'm legitimately trying to help here. <laughs> well, I mean, I've also been, been doing my own, my own researching and, and uh, at the end of this list of, of 11 elements of noir, they're like, here's some uh, classic noir to read. And uh, oh, actually, I gotta grab it and make sure uh, the um, the first book that they recommended, which I was able to find it on the Libby app for the public library, uh, is by Raymond Chandler, mm-hmm. and it's called The Big Sleep. Yeah, uh, and it's about a uh, detective uh, Philip Marlowe. Uh, <clears throat> apparently, in film, he is most famously portrayed by uh, Liam Neeson. <laughs> But, um, and Liam Neeson seems like a natural fit for this detective internal monologue thing. Like, I just, I, I so it's kind of interesting. So, Sherlock Holmes isn't noir because a bad guy mm. did it, right? Like, I, like, I think the thing that like separates noir from detective is a good guy doing bad things rather than a bad guy doing good things, hmm. Um, but so I, I'm I'm reading through uh, I'm, I'm looking at this I'm like it turns out that this is part of a, a series with about Philip Marlowe and I'm 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 like two thirds of the way through the first book The Big Sleep mm-hmm. uh, and I was like well I, I kind of thought I mean obviously as you pointed out with Batman um, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a fatal tragic ending well I do have to clarify well, Batman's mm-hmm. only noir in early Batman things when he's the main character. So in the mm. Batman animated series where he's going around being detectives or Batman year one type stuff, it's noir. Right. The moment Superman enters, it's no longer noir because we're no longer following from his internal and external point of view. Right. I, I just need that clarification uh, that Batman quickly stops being noir when someone makes a giant green glowy fist and punches someone. <laughs> I mean, that's definitely true. Um, I just, um, it surprised me that something considered noir could be a series because I kind of, I felt there's like, it made it sound like they basically had to die at the end of the series or at the end of the the story. I was like, huh. And so then I looked into it and it's like, apparently, uh, a lot of what we consider noir is actually hard boiled. Uh, I could see that. Which is basically. Basically, uh, the same as noir, except for uh, at the end of the story, everything is resolved, uh, and uh, the morally ambiguous character is basically comes away with clean hands. So it's interesting because, like, I'm on TV tropes with film noir pulled up because that's what you do, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. And like the tropes they bring up are the bittersweet ending, that anyone could die, hmm. the black and gray mortal morality, emerging from the shadows, everyone smokes. <laughs> yeah, that's probably police true. are useless, <laughs> police brutality, private eye monologues, screw the rules I have connections, screw the rules I have money, screw the rules I make them. Sherlock scam, hmm. smoking is cool, snow means death, social service does not exist, sympathy for the devil. Too good for the sinful earth. Unreliable narrator. Weather report opening. And who watches the Watchmen? <laughs> uh, oh, and I photo no identification to, denial. I have no idea how to really pull off the the unreliable narrator. Like that one, I don't know how you would do it. It sounds like it'd be a really it's a really interesting challenge, but it's like you kind of hmm. have to be first person. So I have well, an yeah. interesting talk with someone who was helping edit one of their books a while back where when you have a third person narrator if that third person narrator isn't a character you assume they're telling the truth you assume facts Mm. are facts because your brain is shorthanding 
the prose and the exposition, right? right? So yeah. if your narrator's not a character, they can't be unreliable or reliable, and you just get mad because then the book was just wrong, right? So yeah. there's no narrator when it's doing third person, but you can do a limited third person and give that a bit of voice to it. So ironically, Full Metal Alchemist was narrated by Father. Okay. And there's a bit where he voices all the title change cards, except the last one because he's dead. Ah. So if you go that, oh, this was the character that was like the Horatio that framed the story, then you can add a bit of unreliable to it. But for written noir, I just got to feel like first person or thir- limited third person where you slide just into his point of view mm. is how you would do it. But I also am weirdly like, I, I'm i not a fan of unreliable narrators in serious settings. Like in comedy, it makes mm. sense. But I do find like the unreliable narrator is less interesting than just you're in this person's internal world. And you're just limiting what they see and the information they have. Like if you make sure okay. your narrator only knows things that they should know because you've zoomed the mm. camera of sorts in, then you can slip in details right. subtly. But as I've said before, plot twists that aren't foreshadowed aren't interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, like, it really depends on the kind of unreliable narrator you want. Because there's unreliable narrator, as in the book's lying to you. Right. And then there's information missing narrator, where they put together the hmm. pieces because you've limited the pieces. And then there's Glass well, Onion, I, I, where you just have the mystery be so stupid, the character's like, this is so stupid. It's like a Glass Onion. The, the layers mean nothing, because you can see right to the <laughs> middle. It's just dumb. It's not so dumb, it's brilliant. It's just dumb. <laughs> I just like Glass Onion. Just shout out to the Knives Out saga, which did not need a mm. sequel, but somehow crushed it. Yeah, I did enjoy that sequel. Um, but... I'm not necessarily saying that I want to use an unreliable narrator in my story. Of course not. I just, uh, that is one of the uh, elements that the website I looked at was like, yeah, sometimes the narrator is unreliable because uh, they view their actions as pure and heroic, but then the actuality of what they're doing is is brutal and... and uh, yeah, the secret villainous. is definitely cognitive dissonance. By taking their point of view and framing it so what they're doing sounds good, while it's brutal. So, a line actually came up. I was watching a review of Black Butler recently. A review? Okay. So, in this review, a character is about to, for lack of a polite term, beat his fiance, Like, just smack her. Mm. And then, the character, the evil demon butler, as it were, is like here, and goes to hand them a cane so they don't hurt their hand. Okay. So that's insanely dark, right? Right. But like, oh, I get it. This character who's evil with a smile is like, oh, if you're gonna be bad, do it wrong. And it's a way to kind of show that the character is super in the wrong, because, well, you're gonna hit them, but you draw the line at using a stick? I think you're a terrible person. But the reader reviews that without actually taking direct information from the story, right? Mm. So that's kind of how you would do it is, say I was writing Evil Carl. Let's go with Yarl. So Yarl, you have Yarl be about to kick a puppy. And then you have Yarl think, these beasts, unclean, untame everywhere. And I just know with a flick of my boot, I could protect someone from it. And then the corgi coasts through the air and slams into the wall. Because I said the corgi, not the dog. I've made this narrator Mm. super unreliable because I described this ferocious beast, and with a single word I pointed out, this ferocious beast was the size of a capybara at best. (laughs) And was the most harmless breed of dog. So that's kind of how you do it. It's like you have the details not quite match the dialogue and the setting. Mm. That's at least how I'd go about it is if you want someone who thinks they're doing the right thing, but they're not, you have them confidently, and you as the narrator, confidently describe it with details that are just deeply upsetting. Like, uh, if you're doing, uh, like, Shao Tucker's point of view, it would be, and I finally got it, a solution. I can get the money she needs to live, and then she won't leave me, and I'll advance science by a million years and save on pet care and child care. 
<laughs> yeah, that's awful. <laughs> but you see what I mean, right? It's about the confidently stating things that are horrible. Hmm. Uh, that I mean, on, honestly, I, I said I wanted to do an episode on noir fiction, and I I mean, it is an interesting topic. But I realized after uh, reading the definition of hard boiled versus the definition of noir, because like I say, hard boiled is basically noir, but it actually has a moderately happy are we ending. turning into a denny's like where are you possibly going with this because i followed you onto this noir train because you promised me robots and now we're here where are you going well, see, what stop are you getting off on sir well this all comes back to the the story that's, that's, that's the, the sci-fi detective story at, i at thought you were about to come back to the shotgun point. guy <laughs> <laughs> and like so Not where i'm going so. with this is the camera has it in black and white i'm trying to decide if i release it as a noir film where i just voice over <laughs> the guy i do have the the footage that's true <laughs> in black and white specifically probably but no um like the the idea for the story now is basically that uh the detective uh figures out that all these people are missing and the and that the missing link is that they liked this profile on the dating app uh, and then catfishes that profile in order to get a date with them so that you can go and confront them see it's kind of funny because like noir is such a vibe so like you bring hmm. up dating apps i'm like is dating apps noir but i'm looking at this list of noir anime and you know what's sitting hmm. here like six down ghost in the shell huh. ghost in the shell is very noir in its style and themes, especially like the movie versions, right. but absolutely has digital dating apps. Well, yeah, sci-fi and noir are not mutually exclusive. Uh, actually, I was going to ask you, I don't know how well you remember uh, the series Altered Carbon. So good. Watched it last week. You watched it last week. No, two weeks ago uh, when my mom was visiting, I'm like, what's a good show to throw in for me and my mother? And we ended up doing For All Mankind, The Foundation, and Altered Carbon. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, that's that's great because I was going to ask you. Uh, I, I Altered think Carbon is noir as heck. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it shifts away from noir as you get into the, the later seasons where he's actually fighting the systemic corruption uh, and he becomes a genuine hero. Uh, but the first season, for sure, he's oh, the yeah. hard-boiled detective who has self-loathing and, and is morally ambiguous. His butler is Edgar Allan Poe. Dude could not be noir noir if he tried. <laughs> also, for brilliant writing choices to switch out your actor. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, switching the, the stack to a different body. Oh, man, Ultra Carbon was, like, sick. Mm. Just that, yeah, that, that so good. But yes, I see what you're saying. Like, I feel like the episode's not actually so much about noir as about sci-fi noir because I feel like we both have more grounding in that. Well, I mean, I just the the whole point of the, the, the conversation it was just like, yeah, you mentioned wanting to do noir, and I was like, hey, yeah, that sounds interesting, and then realizing that I don't really know what it is. Well, I mean, I do now that I've obviously done some research. Well, what's interesting <laughs> is at the end of the day, genre is a checkbox that your publisher or your self-publisher clicks. Mm. Like, for example, I was having a talk with one of my professors about the difference between YA novels and new adult novels. And it's really about okay. the difficulty curve. And I had a conversa the same conversation later with one of my mentors about the same topic of, it was a genre that was popular for a while and just kind of faded away, but Canada's just getting it because we're just behind America. Ah. And the idea is that it has different themes. It's about people who are just becoming adults and entering the world where YA is about teenagers growing up and the new adult is about now that they've grown up, they've realized they haven't learned anything. Mm. But the reason I say that is, like, I'm looking at this anime list for noir. And yes, things yeah. like Monster and literally noir yes that is the name of the series are fit the <laughs> okay. feeling but like the big o is a is like a noir thriller about a got batman who has a giant robot what the big o is amazing it is an animated series that's a mecha series but framed like a noir 
So you're literally following a hard-boiled detective who, once he finds the criminal, summons his Gundam to punch them. <laughs> okay. It is amazing. Just, is that on Crunchyroll, I wonder? I hope so. It is so good. So, like... Ah, oh, man. It's not very many episodes, but, like, the poster's in black and white. It's 12 episodes. And it's just... Majestic. That's it. It's just mm. majestic. They're they're trying for a vibe so hard. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like it's on net on uh, Crunchyroll. <laughs> but yeah, That's like right. so we got like Cowboy Bebop, Darker Than Black, Ergo Proxy, Ghost in the Shell, Golgo Thirteen. I'm like, there is a lot of sci-fi noir, and I didn't realize till you brought this up. Not only how common that is, but how good it is. Like. If I were to write my next masterpiece, sci-fi noir is a sick genre for it. Well, okay, would, would you go noir, or would you go more hard-boiled, where where the ending isn't necessarily so bittersweet? Depends what I'm trying to accomplish. So, if it's for the light novel contest, for example, it can't go hard-boiled. Death Note tried that, and when they killed one of the two characters, it stopped being interesting. <laughs> right? You can't go hard-boiled if you want to serialize it. However, mm. most of these went hard-boiled, because when you go hard-boiled, you hit or you hurt people. Mm. Like, you do the most emotional damage by giving it the hard-boiled ending. Like, Cowboy Bebop's huh. ending was just brutal for no reason. And that's what made well, it so good. Just, that, that, that's more the noir ending, right? Like that's, Yeah. Just... No, Cowboy Bebop, he just gets shot, collapses on the stairs and says, bang. Yeah, see, hard hard boiled would be uh, would be him not having the bittersweet ending. That's, yeah, that's that's what I'm going for. Like, I... so I think the First, bittersweet yeah. ending is mm. really good for a standalone work. Mm. And the thing is, if you're committed to knowing you're having that bittersweet ending day one, even if you're planning to do six books in a movie, but you know that's how you're going to end it, it right. affects the pacing and the tone, mm -hmm. and makes it better. So let's go back to Death Note, for example. They yeah. knew from the first chapter that Light was going to get killed off with the Death Note. That's the only way that could possibly end. Mm -hmm. And them splitting it over two seasons lost some impact, but it still had a strong ending, even if it came later than it should have. Right. Ghost of the Shell cheats, because they absolutely have their main character die at the end, to then just go to the cloud. <laughs> Okay. They, like, keep doing the noir ending for them repeatedly. <laughs> which Ooh, is some sh rough. Which is some shenanigans, but also, you know. Mm. So, like, to kind of loop back around to, like, Darker Than Black felt pretty noir. I don't know, because, like, like I said, hard-boiled, no one is going to call you out of your books hard-boiled or noir. Fair. People obviously often use both interchangeably. What they are going to call you out for... Same is if you somehow don't write it monochromatic. Like, you have to write your book in black and white to have the vibes. I know that's weirdly specific. And, like, mm. Cowboy Bebop wasn't in black and white. Darker Than Black wasn't in black and white. But, like, the light trick contrast, like, you literally want to create mood lighting in your work to carry those vibes. Mm. It's one of those things where tropes are overused, but they're also narrative shorthand. You describe people in pinstripe troops with Tommy guns and boom, you got that energy. If you're going sci-fi, mm. you can't quite do that, so you then have someone smoking a cigarette in a brothel, even if you're going <laughs> cyberpunk with it. Because the only difference between cyberpunk and noir is the age of the protagonist. <laughs> like, the big difference okay. between punk and noir is your protagonist in noir has to have been around the bush enough to know that it's morally ambiguous. So it's like, even if they're 20, they have to be a super mature 20, where a punk is rebelling against society and might not know. Because as we mm. mentioned earlier, the whether or not you're trying to make societal change shifts how noir you are. Right. Like, the fact that mm. Batman doesn't achieve anything at the start is what makes him noir. When he actually starts accomplishing things, he becomes a family man with a sensible SUV. <laughs> Joins the Justice League. Mm -hmm. Also, Speed Graffer, would you call that noir? 
Ooh. It feels it like it wants to be. That, it definitely has that bittersweet ending. Uh, and it is it is very first person. I mean, so, which is interesting because of the like the photography theme. Because <laughs> I feel like protagonist guy, Saga, I think it was, is a noir protagonist. But when the series isn't following him, it kind of slips out of noir a bit. Mm. Like, Mr. Swetengu is busy being way too good of a villain for <laughs> that show. <laughs> like, he's not a noir <laughs> villain, but he is. Like, he's more a classic, tragic Sephiroth villain, and then kind of pivots at the end. It's like the protagonist feels noir, and the villain feels a little too shounen. Well, I mean, it is Mr. Swetengu would just be in the Akatsuki. It, it is a little bit interesting, like, uh... Like, if he didn't have superpowers, he'd be a great noir villain. Uh, Maybe. I mean, you see this. Because he made a a difference. You say he's a noir protagonist, but at the same time, he is a little bit more of that traditional righteous hero. Like, he gives off noir vibes, but he he doesn't really, like, he's not an anti-hero. Like, he's definitely in, like, it's like he got thrown in a noir setting. Like, Mm. the city is a noir city. Like, the rich are literally gambling on superpowers in their underground sex clubs. Like, it's problematic. Mm. But, like, yeah, he has a bit of that life is in shades of gray, kind of nihilistic, goes through an arc. Like, it wouldn't have been hard to tilt Speedgrapher into being noir. It sits there on the cusp. I would say it's, like, directly... I think it's directly between noir and shonen, which is the weirdest genre because shonen is just superhero comics, but just, just straight up, Marvel and shonen are the same genre. <laughs> uh, yeah, they definitely are. <laughs> Weirdly enough, some parts of Kagurabunchi that come up once in a while, like we were talking about, what feel more like mafia esque, and it's like mafia and noir are similar, not quite. But Kagibuchi definitely has more noir energy than some actual noir things have. But it's that one seems to be pivoting to more classic shonen now that they're like starting to team up and number your villains like you do. Yeah, uh, yeah, numbering the people they have to rescue and who's going after them, yeah. Yeah, they're just kind of doing the setup. You know, how it, they're doing the Kenshin. Which, to be fair, Kenshin was great, so. <laughs> you know what? Kenshin, Ken- Kenshin was so great. So did you ever see the Samurai X, like, movie they did, where it was just, like, his sad backstory as a movie? Uh, I don't know that I ever watched the movie. Because his sad backstory, I, I don't know if I'd call Kenshin noir, but, like, definitely he was in a nihilistic world where everyone was against him. But I think the thing is the noir character doesn't usually kill people except as a last resort, usually. Like, they're trying to... It's like, part of it's almost like you're trying to be lawful good from your perspective, even if you're not. I I don't know. Have you ever seen Dirty Harry? Mm, (laughs) Touché. I mean, so technically, uh, neo-noir apparently only applies to film. uh, And it's only, like, anything made in the noir style post, like, 1960 or something like that. Well, if you want to be one of those Uh, guys, sure. I was just saying, I was reading, I was doing a lot of reading on this because, uh, it became your life. Like... <laughs> well, it might be, I don't know. Do you want me coming back to the, the story that I'm trying to write though? Um, my number one problem I'm having with the story as, as it is, is, um, one of, one of the people commented on my other short story that I'm going subs- to submit to, uh, the magazine. Um, and, uh, they said that one of my, my opening paragraph about the, about the mirror being a screen that projects outfits onto the reflection. Um, they said that was a good way to make sure that, uh, that the readers know it's speculative sci-fi and fiction right at the get go. I'm like, Hmm, how do I, cause the sci-fi is, is the person <clears throat> kidnapping people and turning them into robots. But if that's the twist, how do you even know that it's sci-fi until you get there? Oh, so if you want it to be sci-fi, so here's what Cowboy Bebop did. Mm. So you got two characters in a metal room that looks kind of like a ship. You got one dude Mm -hmm. with a robot arm smoking a cigarette. 
Okay. Yeah, that's it. You want something to be sci-fi noir, you have a dude with a robot arm smoking a cigarette. Well, another character laments that it's just another day in paradise. Typically by saying literally it's another day in paradise, and then cut to some poor children dying on the street or something. <laughs> but yeah, like, sometimes it can literally just be the smoke-filled room. The inexplicable include blips the in the arm. background. Include the robot arm to make sure people know it's sci-fi. Well, a lot of it's setting, right? Like, let's take Ghost in the Shell, for example. Pretty early on, we have people in their sci-fi room, and then their fingers split open to a bunch of little typey fingers. Mm. And then that scene instantly, you know, exactly where you're, like, what this piece is going to be. Because their fingers split open and started typing on a keyboard, which is deeply upsetting, but also kind of functional. <laughs> Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> and like the thing is, a lot of it opens with the monologue too. Mm. So, for example, here's the paragraph that describes the Samurai Jack episode I was telling, talking about, about the robot X49. The episode mm. opens deep in another nondescript city. Rain falls over the branches, hovels, and lampposts. An old fashioned looking car with a red eyed robot driver sits in the side of the street. He slips a seat into his radio, and Techno Trumpets starts to steal the air which seems to slow to a car. Lulu, sweet thing he says, following by why he hates the rain, how it makes him sentimental. <laughs> if that didn't immediately go tone, function, location, mm. literally listening to jazz music but techno in an old-fashioned car while being a robot, complaining about the rain because it makes him think about sad, how it makes him sentimental. <laughs> and then like the next scene you see is the robot he talks about initially robots were wobbly and uncertificated but then we have robot as co assassins in coats, hats, and wingtips their job was to seek out dissonance and eliminate them he was different, he was built by an eccentric engineer to learn, understand, and worst feel ooh right, and that's just oh, like man. that one episode of Samurai Jack sometimes Samurai Jack just feels like being better than it deserves to be <laughs> There's there's some episodes where you're like, oh, this is skip and a miss, and there's other ones where you're like, oh, we're just going to play with the dynamic lighting in this scene and go hard on it for no reason. <laughs> well, uh, I think I've gotten everything that I wanted to know to, out of you from as relates to hard-boiled and noir fiction. Well, yeah, I had to make sure to use up our entire hour that I was trying to prevent. <laughs> Uh, so I do believe that. Have time, do we still have time for a random question? Absolutely, we do. Which at some point I'll make you look through our comments and find random questions, but that time <laughs> is not today. So, <laughs> here is our random question Which cartoon character would you like to be best friends with? Oh. Which cartoon character would I like to be best friends with? Man, I'm so torn on this one. Oof. <laughs> Mm. So, like, Robin but Williams' he... genie is just the rig dancer, right? Like, not only is it Robin <laughs> Williams, it's also a literal genie. Like, my brain also mm. went, like, Cosmo from Fairly Odd Parents would be hilarious, but now I'm just trying to, like, it's an exploit of friendship, and I'm not okay with that. I need a best friend on my level. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Can I just say Pikachu? <laughs> is that, like, fair game here? <laughs> Best friends with Pikachu. <laughs> that still seems like it might be exploitive. A little bit, a little bit. I'll let you answer while I try and find a less exploitive cartoon best friend that I would just get along well with. Uh, well, see, I think I would like to be uh, like Jimmy Neutron's friend. I mean, it's very dangerous. That seems his, exploitive. His inventions, his inventions backfire and stuff. But no, I mean, he's he would. I would actually really enjoy. Uh, being his friend, helping him test out these things. Like, I would enjoy being Carl in his universe. First off, that makes sense. Second off, though, I think you picked the wrong genius, because it's like, Jimmy's kind of insufferable. Right? <laughs> like, he's just like... <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> I'm going Dexter. Because <laughs> Dexter knows he has other flaws, and is, quite frankly, alarmingly similar to some of my friends, so I can get that. But I also kind of want, like, a ride-or-die cartoon character best friend, and I'm like, hmm. 
I'm still not sold. Like, you know, you know I think I nailed it. it. Took me a while. Donatello. Donatello. Ooh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like that for characters, not only is Donatello a seven foot tall ninja turtle, but he'd also actually play Gundam Breaker with me. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, okay, uh, but would he be any good at it? He only has, like, three fingers on each hand. Yeah, you, you think he doesn't have, like, a, some crazy pressure tentative compensating, like, tool controller he built for this? Like, he's got ah, that's this. that's a good point. Like, he's got this. <laughs> Not only that, but, like, he's just, he's the most chill of the turtles. Like, I'm sorry, Party Dude is not the chillest turtle. No, definitely not. So, yes, I'm going Donatello the Ninja Turtle. Because, mm. like, I, I think that'd be a good mutual friendship. Like, I can go out in daylight, and he's a ninja. Like, it balances nicely. You are right that Jimmy Neutron is a bit insufferable, but I, I'm... Now, you can commit, just because I find someone insufferable. Because remember, I'd be the Jimmy in this situation, right? Like, I would be the one who was insufferable, not the other way around. <laughs> like, really, you should have uh... said Jimmy, and I should have said Carl, and all balance would be set, but... <laughs> <laughs> that would have been pretty funny now i'm gonna lock it in jimmy neutron all right Let's... and with that that is this week's episode i don't know support some local literary magazines go buy a copy of fusion fragment like i mean like you can afford it you can afford it you, you know yeah, how you already funny. treated yourself to your pumpkin spi- spice latte go buy a literary magazine with your money that would be your second pumpkin spice latte you can do this. I, I believe in all of you. I kept, uh, I kept wanting to say Fusion Frenzy, uh, but I knew that was not the second F, so I, I, but Fusion Fragments. Yeah, that's, so go that's check amazing. them out. They're awesome. <laughs> not sponsored. Not sponsored, but like, you could just download free issues or buy a nice paperback one, so like, it's one of those things where it's like, it's weird to advertise free services to people, because it's like, you have to push mm-hmm. energy to sell people on things they get. Like, I worked enough time in student service to be like, but seriously, you should go use your free gym. And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, it's free. <laughs> Why would you not? <laughs> but it's like, you almost have to, like, upsell and be like, yo, check out this cool magazine. I sure probably shouldn't tell you this, but they're open for submissions, but don't tell anyone, right? Like, just between you and me and the internet, just check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what a random episode. Like, we kind of touched on noir. Like, noir sci-fi would probably be the episode title. Noir sci-fi and shotgun ninjas. (laughs) How is that your real life? Like, (laughs) that's just insane. Your real life was the most wacky thing we talked about. (laughs) Batman came up multiple times. And your real life is the most wacky thing that actually happened. That's just... How are you alive? How are you a living person? I don't get it sometimes. Okay. Also, I should probably stop recording. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>